My name is Andy Jones. I'm the CEO of Ramsey here in the UK. Ramsey Healthcare is a global provider of healthcare. We operate in 11 countries, employing 77,000 staff. And incredibly, we look after over 8 million patients a year. Ramsey Healthcare has been here in the UK for the last 12 years. We've now become the number one provider for NHS services, which means that GPs are able to choose Ramsey Hospitals to refer their patients for high quality healthcare. So Ramsey has got a long-standing set of values called the Ramsey Way. They really define who we are as an organisation, how we work together, how we look after patients, and ultimately it's all about people caring for people. We're very proud of the services that we provide, and that's largely due to teamwork and our staff. The difference that this makes for patients is really high quality healthcare in all of our hospitals and facilities. We've got an absolutely fantastic programme called Speaking Up for Safety. It's all about training staff to be positive and to call out episodes in patients' care, particularly when they're concerned that things aren't going right. We've been able to grab this programme and we're the first organisation in the UK to roll this programme out. The future for Ramsey Healthcare is bright both globally and for us here in the UK. All of our units are accredited for endoscopy. The Care Quality Commission has rated 92% of our hospitals as good and 95% of our patients would recommend us to their friends and family. We're a leader in day case surgery. We've looked at the way that our hospitals are designed so that we can treat ever more patients in today's healthcare. The future of healthcare is all about partnerships and integrating the patient journey. At Ramsey, this means we need to be working very closely with all our partners, including the NHS, to make sure that our services are available in all the communities that our hospitals serve. Over time, I can see the company both growing and expanding in the reach of its services. But for me, most of all, patient safety and quality come first. Simply put, people caring for people. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's BOFAS Lecture of Distinction on the Cave of Eris Foot. Uh, apologies for the uh, technical problems of the video with, to start with. Uh, my name is Howard Davis. I work in Sheffield, and tonight's speakers are Matt Welk and Curran Mulhotra from Stanmore. Just like to say a quick thank you to uh, Ramsey for sponsoring tonight's lecture. Okay, so um, house rules as per usual. Uh, please submit any questions using the Q and A icon bottom uh, button at the bottom of the screen. Attendance certificates for CPD will be issued following submission of your feedback. As usual, you should receive an automated feedback email after logging out of tonight's broadcast. And if you don't receive the automated email in the next 24 hours, then uh, please use any previous link and enter the new code that was shown in the Zoom chat shortly. Uh, so as I've mentioned tonight, we're very, very lucky to have uh, two of the most prominent and best, essentially, foot and ankle surgeons in the country, uh, Karen Malhotra and Matt Welk. They both work out Stanmore and have stellar reputations as both surgeons and educators. Um, they're going to talk to us tonight about Cave of Eris feet. And what they're going to do is talk for about 15 minutes. And then we're going to have some Viva sessions. And we've already had three volunteers who are going to be gently guided through some Viva questions. We, If anybody else wishes to volunteer, uh, just let us know. And if you put that on the, on the Q&A session, we may be able with an email address. If there's time, we may be able to, to accommodate the, those volunteers. If you have any questions on the main uh, topics or any questions after the Viva sessions, then again, put them through Q&A and we'll hopefully answer those for you. Uh, so with, without further ado, uh, over to Matt and Karen. Uh, so thank you, guys. Thanks, thanks a lot, Howard. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm, I'm Karan Mulhotra and um, this is Matthew Welk. I'm just going to share my screen. So hopefully you can all see my uh, presentation now. Um, so last year we delivered you a talk on Pescavis and I did a section on biomechanics and Matt did a section on how to actually treat the cable virus foot. Um, and this year we want to sort of build on that a little bit. So the goals of this session are to give you more practical pointers by going through some cases. Because often it's 
theory and practice are slightly different and really give you an understanding of our thinking for particular cases. So just gonna be a quick refresher and this is only gonna take a few minutes. Um, but remember a cavus foot is a high arched foot and the arch fails to flatten on weight bearing. And it's called a cavus foot, but really often, most often in fact, cavus is not the only deformity. And remember there's often a neurological cause in up to about two thirds of the cases. A cavus foot is, in some senses, a reverse of a planus foot because it's a tight foot. And broadly speaking, there are four types of cavus feet. Okay, so there's the pure cavus foot, and that is sometimes may be called subtle cavus. So basically, here you've got a problem with the first ray, where the first ray is plantar flexed, and any compensations which you happen or any of the hind foot is secondary to that. Then you've got cavo varus, which is normally a neuromuscular problem. Um, and that's seen in the uh, middle picture over here. So there you can get other things like clawing of your toes, you get pronation of your forefoot. So the first ray is plantar flexed um, and you get a sort of twisted foot. And this is the classical reverse pest planus. Then you have ones with cavo equinovirus, which can happen in more spastic disorders. So here you have um, cavo virus, but also you have equinus. And actually because everything is quite tight, you actually get supination of the forefoot rather than pronation. And then finally, you have calcaneo cavus, or otherwise known as posterior cavus. And you can often see this in polio. And these are the ones with a very high calcaneo pitch, and it's really driven by the hind foot. A quick recap on hind foot balance as well. So there's a concept called the calcaneo pedal unit. And basically, if you look here on the small diagram on the right-hand side, you see that there is, a, in shaded, you see the tibia and the talus, and these two sort of sit one on top of the other. And the rest of the foot, sort of goes underneath that. And that's classed as the calcaneopedal unit. And that can sort of swivel underneath, back and forth underneath the talus. And that's controlled by guy ropes on either side. And these guy ropes are namely the tibialis posterior, which sort of inverts the hind foot and the peroneus brevis, which sort of everts the hind foot via this calcaneopedal unit. In the forefoot, the balance is by the tibialis anterior and the peroneus longus, both of which attach to the base of the first metatarsal. And as they pull, they pull for the paradis longus goes and pulls underneath the foot and pulls the big toe down and the tibialis anterior comes from the top and pulls the big toe up. So they have supination and pronation at the forefoot. Don't worry, I know I'm going through these quickly, but it'll come out more and more in the cases. And then finally, there's the tripod. So remember, in order to balance, you need to have a stable base and you need a minimum of three points for a stable base. And in the foot, that's the first metatarsal head the heel and the third metatarsal head. And you can't balance on just two. So if one of them is abnormal or it's a bit skew, you, your foot will tip and it can't do that. So there must be some con um, compensation somewhere or the other to allow the foot to be flat to the floor. So in this example, you see that there's pronation of the first ray. So the first ray is plantar flexed. And the heel looks straight and that's fine, but you can't walk around on just one point. So what you need is you either need to make a hole in the floor for that foot to, that big toe to sit into, or the rest of your foot tilts and your hind foot goes into varus. And this is a four foot driven hind foot varus, which we commonly see. And this is also the basis of the Coleman block test, because if you put a Coleman block or the blue block shown here underneath the rest of the foot and allow the ground therefore to compensate for the first ray, which is plantar flexed, the hind foot no longer has to tip into varus. So if you see a hind foot varus and you do a Coleman block test and the hind foot now corrects, then that means it was a four foot driven problem and the hind foot's flexible. So that was a very quick recap of some of the key principles that we're going to sort of go into more detail. And I'm gonna hand over to Matt now to talk about the operative side. Thanks, Karen. So before we move on to cases, um, just picking out from our first lecture, some of the treatment uh, you know, principles of treatment. Um, so, and this is really to give you an algorithm to think about the cavus foot and how to treat the cavus foot. And then we can apply this algorithm to all the cases that we see. So the, the main principles are, you know, firstly, put the foot below the leg. So put the foot in the right position below the leg, and then make sure the foot is flat to the ground. And as Karen's been saying, balance the muscle power. So that's absolutely key. A lot of these cavus feet are neurological. They need to make sure at the end of it, not only is the foot flat, but the, the, the foot is balanced. Otherwise what will happen is gradually it will recur. And 
the, the way that I'd like to uh, teach you to understand is to understand the deformity and think about the deformity at each level. Uh, and therefore each operation is different. So if you go to the next slide. So firstly, thinking about the ankle. So ankle, hind foot, mid foot, fore foot. Think about it like that when you're assessing a caver's foot. So you look at this picture here and you think, you know, oh, you know, my God, that's a severe deformity. But if you try and break it down, so looking at the ankle, yeah, so you can see the, so I'll go back one, Karen. And I mean, you can see the ankle looks like it's pointing laterally with the foot then twisted medially. And I mean, it's very difficult to know what's going on in the ankle there, but the hind foot's certainly in varus and the ankle's pointing laterally. And you can see on this PET CT, uh, on the weight bearing CT, that the ankle is pointing outwards with a foot then twisted all the way in. But the things you want to know um, about the ankle is, is it in Aquinas? And is that Aquinas coming from the ankle itself? So I go back, um, or, or is it coming from uh, the, the, the midfoot? Is it varus, is that varus fixed or is it correctable? Is the ankle arthritic and is it rotated? So in this particular example, you could put the foot straight in the right place, but it'll be moving in a different plane to the ankle. So it's important to think about the deformity of the ankle. If you, if you move up the next slide, then talking about Aquinas, where's the Aquinas coming from in the ankle? So in the, in the, in the left-hand picture, you can see the calcaneal pitch is straight, if not pointing downwards. So this has got quite a lot of ankle Aquinas. Um, and if you were to do an Achilles lengthening, it would allow that calcaneal pitch to come up. Uh, but if you look at the example on the right, the calcaneal pitch, the, the foot by all intents is in Aquinas, but the calcaneal pitch is normal. So this Aquinas is coming from the midfoot and it will be a big mistake to over lengthen the Achilles to deal with that Aquinas because then all you're going to do is increase your calcaneal pitch that end up with heel pain. So you've got to work out where the Aquinas is coming from. Next slide. The hind foot. So is the hind, the hind foot is usually or often in varus. And it's important to work out, is the hind foot flexible or is it fixed? And if it's flexible, you might be able to do something like a calcaneal osteotomy to move it from varus into valgus. If it's fixed in varus or arthritic, it may require an arthrodesis. Next slide. And then this concept is really important and curran has been talking about it already. So it's the relationship of the midfoot and the forefoot to the hind foot. So you look at the picture on the top right, and you can imagine that if you got grabbed the heel and twisted the heel into valgus, you would drive the first metatarsal into the ground. So uh, when you correct the heel, you're going to increase the pronation of the forefoot. So you need to uh, think about when you're evaluating the cavus foot, you know, once the ankle and the hind foot are corrected, what is my forefoot going to look like? And the, the, the typical deformities would be pronation, like we mentioned, or adduction. And if it's a pure pronation and the big toe is driven into the ground, you might get away with the dorsal flexion osteotomy of the first metatarsal. You might need to do the first and the second. And if it's really severe and you've got a lot of cavus left, then you might need a wedge tarsectomy. And particularly if once you've corrected the hind foot, the midfoot is adducted, and you've got a lot of adduction, a sort of banana shaped foot, that patient may well need a wedge tarsectomy in order to get their foot progression angle normal. If you go forward a slide. I'm not gonna to talk too much about the toes, uh, but just for those coming up to the exam, um, you might hear about the Jones procedure of the big toe. Um, and what that is, just to go through it quickly, is um, you've got hyperextension of the MTP joint uh, with flexion of the IP joint. So if you cut the extensor, it will allow the MTP joint to come down. You then thread the extensor through the metatarsal head to pull the metatarsal head up and then you fuse the IP joint. And that's a, a, one of the typical components of a cavus foot correction because they often have claw hallux. Next slide. And then finally, reiterate it. You can do what you want to get the foot back, to get, get the foot in the right position, but it needs to be balanced. So that depends on the examination findings. You've got to examine all the tendons to see and all the muscle powers to work out what needs balancing. And some of the most common ones would be a tibialis posterior tendon transfer, the, uh, the tip post is strong, which is pulling the hind foot into varus. And then you can transfer that 
onto the either a bony trans or onto the middle middle or lateral cuneiform to either the foot or onto a, a tendon to tendon onto the perineum. And the other one that's very common is a longus to brevis transfer. So the longus is strong, which is plantar flexing the first metatarsal, and the brevis is weak, which is reducing eversion. So you pl plug the longus onto the brevis, and you reduce the plantar flexion of the first metatarsal, and you increase the eversion. So those are some of the common tendon transfer. And then finally, uh, if you want to remember one thing from today, the, the most common thing to do for a capybaris foot. Um, so if it's flexible, so find out, work out if it's a flexible deformity or a fixed. If it's flexible, you, you're going to do osteotomies. If it's fixed, you're going to do fusions, really. So a flexible deformity, um, the, the algorithm would be a lateralizing calcaneus osteotomy. And then you're going to do a um, probably a first metatarsal flexion osteotomy as well to balance the forefoot. And then you're going to do a tip post tendon transfer to, to balance all the tendons. And if it's fixed, you're going to do fusions of the hind foot. Again, tip post tendon transfer, dorsal flexion osteotomy the first. And that's a sort of fairly safe thing to say that's not ridiculous. And if you say that in the exam, you're, you're along the right lines. And now we're going to move on to do some cases. Okay, great, thanks. So, um, Howard's popped up. So, have you got any questions as yet? No questions yet, but just to say uh, thanks, guys, for simplifying what's a really difficult uh, condition, what a lot of us have struggled to, to manage. And you provided us with a really uh, sound and clear and straightforward um, algorithm for, for management there. So, I think hopefully everybody watching will have, will have benefited from that. So, yeah, what we're going to do now is, as we said before, is it's going to be around about five vivas. I think Matt and Karen are going to do one each just as, a, as an example. And then we've got some uh, kind volunteers who, who are going to go straight on after that. Any questions, let me know. And we can we can sort of give those to uh, to Matt and Karen as uh, as we go. Thank you, guys. Great. Thanks, Howard. So so the first case is, is a case which I was involved in and sort of as an example, um, Matt's going to ask me a few questions and we'll just talk through what our uh, rationale for these things are using the algorithms we talked about before. So this is a 38-year-old gentleman who's got slowly progressive bilateral deformities. And uh, the issues that he's having is the big toe is irritating on the shoes from his claw hallux. He's got a problem with balance and his pain is all on the lateral border of the forefoot because that's where he's loading. So my first question to you, Curran, uh, will be, can you describe the deformities that you see? So, yeah, so this is a image of a right foot of this 38 year old gentleman and you have views from sort of the side, the front and the back. So I'm going to start with the view from the back and the view from the back. It's showing that he's got a varus deformity. So if you can all see my mouse, you can see clearly that he's got um, his Achilles tendon goes this way and the heel goes into varus. I'm also looking from the back, you can get the impression that he's got a cavus here and probably he's got pronation of the um, first ray. I'm then gonna look at this picture in the bottom corner over here. And here you can see that he's got a cavus and you can see the high arch. And um, over here, you can also get the impression that although he's weight bearing and the, the sole of his foot looks flat, his whole foot is tilted across and therefore, this looks like a very plantar flex first ray and therefore it looks to be pronation. In terms of adduction, there doesn't seem to be that much adduction here because his foot doesn't quite look like a banana shape from the back or the side. Um, you can see where he's going to get pressure points on the lateral side where I'm sort of gesturing to now with my cursor. Um, also, when you look again from the um, side here and from the front, you can see that his hallux is in the air um, and that sort of clawing of the hallux, which is usually an intrinsic balance problem. Um, and you can see, if you look closely, you can see a little bit of irritation where he's got um, rubbing on his shoe. So if you put that together, I've got a hind foot varus, I've got a cavus deformity, I've got clawing of the toes. Um, this is, a, and it looks like it's pronation of the forefoot without much adduction. This looks like a cable varus deformity, and it looks like it's probably part of a neuromuscular disorder. Okay, and a question for you. Uh, when you're examining this patient, um, how would you determine whether this is a flexible deformity or whether it's rigid? 
So again, you could do a Coleman block test um, and that will give you an idea about, and it's a good visual way of giving you an idea about how much it corrects. It's, it's really important though that the Coleman block test is not considered just in isolation um, because sometimes there are various muscle deforming forces, et cetera. And what you have to understand is sometimes a tight Achilles um, can stop you from correcting your hind foot unless you take it out of the equation. But if you're actually standing, you may not completely relax that Achilles. So what I do, obviously, you, you get them to stand, you inspect them, you get them to walk, you look for signs of foot drop. Um, but then I get them to lie down. And when I lie down, I make sure that I have the Achilles loose. And then I take my hands and I try and correct the hind foot and see if I can get it to neutral or into valgus. Often you can't get it into valgus, but you can probably get it into about neutral. What you may have to do to do that, though, is plant to flex the foot a little bit because what happens is your Achilles tendon takes a shortcut down the side over time and becomes tight and becomes an inverter. Um, and if, regardless of what the equinus position is, if I can correct the hind foot there, I get an idea that that's a flexible hind foot deformity. I then sort of feel on the tail joint with my thumb and forefinger and then try and grab the front of the foot and reduce it both rotationally. So I try and correct the pronation and adduction and abduction to give you an idea about, or give myself an idea about the um, flexibility at that level. Okay, the next slide. Yeah. So what, what's the likely diagnosis here? So if you've got a young chap who's had a progressive bilateral disorder, who's got clear muscle wasting and things like that, then the most likely thing is to be a neuromuscular disorder. If you have a bilateral progressive neuromuscular disorder, the most common thing is going to be Charcot-Marie Tooth. And that's about 80% of patients. If you've got a family history of it, it's likely to be 90% of patients. And the most common type of Charcot-Marie Tooth is, is CMT1A, which is about 50% or 56% of patients who've got um, Charcot-Marie Tooth. And that commonly starts in the adolescent. So again, the history will guide you. But obviously, we have to make sure because always have tumor in the back of your mind, especially if it's a unilateral or progressive disorder. And if you, if this gentleman pitched up to your clinic, um, what investigations would you do for him? So firstly, yeah. investigations for the foot deformity. And then secondly, anything else you might do? For the diagnosis. So, so for the foot deformities, once I've done my clinical examination, which is really key uh, in my assessment, um, I do some plain weight-bearing radiographs. In my practice, because we have it available in the complex cases, if there's any doubt, I would get a weight-bearing CT scan. I don't think it's required in this gentleman necessarily. Um, and, and that's what I would do as a baseline for him. Of course, you do a complete neurological examination as well, and you need to test out all the muscle strengths, and you've got a very good video about that coming up. However, in terms of investigating the rest of his disorder, if it's not already been done, you'll need nerve conduction studies at a minimum. Um, you, depending on what you find, you know, you may need an MRI spine, et cetera, if you're worried about tumor, um, but you may also need genetic testing and a formal assessment by a neurologist. Okay, and then we're saying that this is a flexible deformity. Yeah. So how would you treat this gentleman? Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead a couple of slides so we can talk about his, his radiographs. So, so, so these are his radiographs, and, and you can see that this is a weight-bearing radiograph, but he's still got a bit of equinus fix because his heel isn't quite touching the ground. Also, looking at this radiograph, you can see that there is some rotation. And what I mean by that is you can see that the first metatarsal over here is at a different plane on this X-ray than the fifth metatarsal. So that suggests to me that he's, he's tilted a little bit. Um, he's not got a lot of ankle arthritis, but he has got equinus at the ankle as evidenced by a Taylor declination angle. Um, so I then would apply this algorithm that we talked about before. And, and this is the algorithm. So we have established that this chap's got CMT, he's got a cable virus foot and he's flexible. So the next thing, if I'm going around this algorithm, I ask myself key questions. So the first thing that you ask yourself is, is he in equinus? And the answer is yes, he is in equinus, although not massively. So for me, this gentleman will get an Achilles lengthening. Probably with his degree, I would do percutaneous lengthening like a hope because I think he only needs about five degrees or so. I then decide, does he need a lateralizing calcaneal osteotomy? And the question I ask myself there is, has he got hind foot varus? And yes, he does. Now, sometimes this is controversial, but I very rarely don't do a lateralizing calcaneal osteotomy because 
these patients, you have to remember, when they grow up and they've got their problems since adolescence, they actually become developmentally abnormal. And just a couple of months ago in Foot and Ankle International, they have done 3D modeling using computers to look at meshes and look at the shape of the bones. And they've actually found that the calcaneus of these people has curved into varus and their radius of curvature has changed. So you actually do need a lateralized calcaneal osteotomy for a lot of these patients. I then say for the, so that he gets lateralized and calcaneal osteotomy. I then say, how is he unbalanced? Has he got a foot drop or does he just need correction of inversion? And this gentleman, it, it has a foot drop and, and he has a foot drop and that's probably why he's got a tight Achilles. So the foot drop probably came first and the Achilles is tightened over time. So for him, he needs a tendon transfer, which corrects the inversion to eversion and also corrects dorsiflexion. And the, one of the good tendon transfers, which does that is a tibialis posterior tendon transfer. And I would usually put that to the lateral cuneiform. So that's what he's going to get. And then we ask ourselves, does he have cavus? So will his tripod need balancing? And yes, he does have cavus and his tripod does need balancing. So we're going to correct that foot pronation partly through the tendon transfer. But as you said earlier, Matt, basically when you correct the hind foot and everything, the pronation might actually get a bit worse. So you then need to dorsiflex the first metatarsal to try and compensate and rebalance the tripod. And then I look at his forefoot and does he need any forefoot corrections? Well, yes, he does. He had clawing of his EHL. Um, and so what we do is we take away the deforming force, which is the EHL, detach it from there and go and attach it to um, the neck of the uh, metatarsal. And actually that converts the EHL, which was now first, you know, it was acting as extensive substitution. It now helps assist the dorsiflexion and helps pull the first ray out of pronation as well. Um, but that leaves the IP joint floppy. And so he needs um, to have that fused to stop it going all over the place. So having done that, we then go post-operatively. You see the weight-bearing view. He's a lot better. His tailor declination is a lot better. He's had his calcaneal osteotomy, his dorsiflexion osteotomy, and you can see the rotation is corrected as well. Um, so that's how I would approach this case. Great. So, uh, the second case. Yeah. Um, so are, there any, are there any questions at this stage? Um, how or should I be just go on? Sorry, slow on the IT. Um, a question from Talal Abu Amara, uh, but is the Aquinas here in mid foot or hind foot was the question. Yeah, so, that, so that, that, that's, that's a very good question and it's often the crux of the matter. So um, I'm gonna just try and annotate on this um, a little bit. So what you're kind of looking at is you're trying to get an idea of two things. So one, you're trying to get, um, you draw the Cora. So the Cora is the center of rotation of angulation and you draw a line up here along the first metatarsal and you draw a line down here. Oops, this is a random seismic spike. And you kind of see, right, okay, yeah, he does have a little bit of um, plantaris and, and, that's, and that's there without a doubt. But, but he's also got, this is his tailor declination angle is also abnormal. So he's got equinus there as well. So I opted therefore to treat a little bit the equinus at the ankle. And I haven't, if you see here, if you're being absolutely um, pure, what I haven't done is I haven't completely taken away the plantaris, but what I have done is I've corrected it a little bit by um, osteotomy. And that does create a bit of a zigzag bone, but overall the person's um, tripod is corrected and his, his balance is better. So um, we found that this does work. And so just one more question from Viv Balachanda. Um, do you guys do, uh, a plantar fascia release routinely or do you uh, just use it as and when necessary no, it's, a, it's a good question one i, th I thought would be asked uh, i think uh, in america uh, they tend to do a lot of plantar fascial releases and the theory behind it is by releasing the plantar fascia you allow the calcaneus to translate easier and you can correct some of the cavus through it but traditionally at stanmore um, we haven't done them um, and haven't found that it's made a massive difference. And so I, I don't ever, hardly ever do a plantar fascial release in my cavus feet. And I know that I don't think any of my colleagues at Stanmore do, um, although it is quite common practice. Um, so if you say as part of your cavus foot correction, you consider a plantar fascial release is an entirely reasonable thing to say that lots of people do, uh, but I personally don't. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, so, okay, to so move on, I hope.
Okay, so yeah, let's move on to case two then. And, and this one is one of uh, a case that Matt's operated on. So I'm going to sort of wiver him on it in a way. So um, Matt, we've got a 27 year old gentleman who's got a diagnosis of CMT type one, I presume one A. Um, and he's got a severe left foot rigid deformity. So this is not flexible, this is rigid. He's got a past mystery of astra, he's asthma, he's an accountant. And his problem is he finds that his left foot and ankle is unstable. He doesn't quite fit into his shoes anymore. He's again got pain on the lateral forefoot and he can only walk for about one or two minutes without crutches. And he's tried orthotics. They haven't really worked. So he feels his ankle is, not only is his shoe not fitting, he's got pain, he feels his ankle is buckling. So um, just talk to me a little bit about your approach to this gentleman before we go on to his imaging and things. So yeah, uh, he is a gentleman with CMT and he has got to a point where his foot is very rigid uh, doesn't accommodate any stresses and he's very much loading on the lateral border of the foot um, and he had uh, fairly typical imbalances. Uh, the, the thing with him uh, is that he had tried a lot of orthotics. Um, he'd been through a whole range of orthotics and, uh, and was unable to control his deformity. Um, so he got to a point where he needed to consider surgery because despite the ankle braces and the silicone AFOs and all these things, he was got to a point when he was unbraceable and severely so a lot of these things are picking the, re the, the right point to intervene and when he came he needed intervention because he'd exhausted conservative treatment and he was very functionally debilitated so then it was a matter of assessing his deformity and working out what the best way of treating it would be and uh, Matt, you mentioned that he had tried ankle braces so in a setting of a rigid deformity with ankle instability what what is the role of or how, why do you think ankle braces? Why would you do ankle braces? So I mean, he had some, some, his foot was rigid, but he had lateral ligament insufficiency as well. So he had tried, you know, normal ankle braces, like an AFO, uh, you know, uh, um, an air cast type brace that he would break through. And um, he tried custom made AFOs, which can be very beneficial. And he tried even the silicone AFOs, which lots of patients with rigid deformities will find they're able to walk in. Um, so just because the deformity is rigid doesn't mean it's unbraceable. You can still brace a rigid deformity. Um, and, you know, with, with a rigid AFO, patients can walk around very easily. But you do, some reach a point where they cannot be braced. Okay, great. Thank you. And so, okay, so here's some radiographs. So could you tell me what you see on these ones? So this is uh, a, an attempt at an AP of an ankle, though you can see it's rotated. And the points to pick up on this are that the ankle doesn't look overly arthritic, uh, but there's clearly a various tilt to the ankle in that there's an increased joint space on the lateral side. And if at the tip of the fibula, there's an avulsion fracture or perhaps from the tip of the fibula, which could show that his opening up on the lateral side could be repeated lateral ligament injuries. Uh, then looking at the heel, um, rather than the calcaneus being in physiological valgus, the calcaneus is sitting medial to where it should be. And then the whole foot is sitting medial to where it should be. So all the metatarsals are angulated medially, whereas they should be much straighter. And you can see from the soft tissue shadows, uh, the degree of varus that he has. Okay, and here's some more imaging. So looking at the lateral x-ray on the left, um, there's perhaps a suggestion of some thinning of the subtalar joint, uh, but it doesn't look all that arthritic, perhaps also some thinning of the talonavicular joint, uh, but it's difficult to say because of the rotation. As you mentioned before, there's significant rotation in that he's going to be loading on the lateral on the fifth metatarsal and all the metatarsals are out of plane. And then perhaps looking at the ankle as well, although we know that there's some tilt to it, there might be some thinning at the front of the ankle. Uh, and then looking at the AP view, comparing to a more normal side on the right, looking at the left-hand image, um, you can see the degree of rotation where the metatarsals are no longer lining up. And also the Taylor head is visible on the lateral side. So rather than in a flat foot where the Taylor head is going medial and the navicular slipping off laterally, on, in a cavus foot, the Taylor head is going laterally and then the navicular is coming off medial. So there's uncoverage or overcoverage, sorry, of the Taylor head with significant supination or, or, or evident on both of these x-rays. Okay. 
and and that's a pet cat. So um, now just to make things a little bit more complicated for you, Matt. So um, we got some long leg alignment views here. And over here, you can see that he's got um, significant valgus at his knee. So, yeah. um, some, so obviously that adds a layer of complexity and you need to think about it. So summing that up, um, you've got a chap who's got a valgus knee. He's got a tight Achilles. His heel is irreducible and doesn't correct. He's got weakness of some of his muscles, his peroneus brevis, his tibant, but his tip post is intact, as is his longus. He's got a plantar flex first ray and incompetent lateral ligaments. So how would you, how would you approach this guy? Oh, he's reached the point for surgery. Yeah, so when I saw him, his valgus knee was very apparent. So I think it's really important with these cases to look at the joint above, like you always say, but it makes a massive difference to the management. Now, when you look at him standing, he had obviously very valgus knees on both sides, and then his hind feet were in varus. So all in all, his hind feet were perhaps compensating for his valgus knees or the other way around. Um, and my feeling with him was that if I then brought his heels out of varus, and brought them into that into physiological valgus that would put a lot of stress on his knees and might then so treat the joint above first so my first thing was to send him to my knee colleagues to say he needs his foot correcting anything you'd like to do with the knee um and then just to, uh, so he ended up having a from our knee surgeon colleagues a proximal tibial osteotomy first to correct his knee alignment followed six weeks later by an open ta lengthening he had incompetent lateral ligament. So for his ankle, there was no arthritis there, but the ligaments were gone. So he had a brostrum lateral ligament reconstruction. His hind foot was completely rigid. Although it wasn't that arthritic, it was completely irreducible. There's no point doing a calcane osteotomy because you're not going to get anywhere with it. So he had a double arthrodesis, which is the subtalar joint, talar joint, bringing his foot round, his metatarsal needed dorsiflexion and a tip post tendon transfer. And that's I mean, what you did, isn't it? Yeah, so this is post-op views. You can see here that his, la his ankle tilt has got better by bringing his heel into the right position. His heel has gone from being varus into being in the correct position and also tightening up his lateral ligaments. His ankle tilt has now gone. Um, you can see that his heel from the subtalar fusion is now in valgus, which is where it should be. And then looking at his AP view, you can see the twist that was present from the supination, the metatarsals are now all straight. And if you look at the, okay, and then looking at the lateral view, you can see again, the twist, all the metatarsals are now lining up. An important point to mention from this um, is that, and going back to the question that you were asked in your last case, um, is that this chap had some equinus coming from his ankle and some plantaris as well, as you were mentioning. And the operation that I did didn't really deal, doesn't really deal, with the plantaris and I was very careful when I was correcting his heel to put his calcaneus into the right position because what would have been you can see that he still does have an element of Aquinas that's coming through his midfoot and if I over dorsiflex his ankle in an attempt to get his foot flat down to the ground he will end up with problems on his heel because he's way you over you increase his calcaneal pitch too much so after the operation I said to him look I've put your heel, in, your, your, your hind foot is corrected in your ankle, but you still do have some, which we spoke about before. And it may be, at the moment, he's doing very well, walking around with a small heel wedge and his foot straight and he's and his, and his, and his back walking and his lateral ligaments are competent and he's not unstable. But he still does have a bit of equinus or plantaris. Um, and yeah, he, he might need that addressed in a secondary surgery. Okay, great. Thank you. So we'll move on to the vivas and we'll try and keep these sort of five minutes each um, and, and not go too far in. So uh, the first viva is Naeem. Are you, are you on? Yeah. Great. Thanks, Naeem. So Naeem, so this is a 28-year-old chap who's got CMT type X on the right side. Don't worry too much about the type of CMT. He's got a severe cavovarus foot. And you can see he's probably got fixed equinus and he's got some fixed adduction but the hind foot is still relatively flexible. He's got difficulty walking because he's got a foot drop and he's got some clawing of his toes. So would you, do you want quickly to, we're not gonna do all the pre other preamble, but do you want quickly to describe the deformities that you see? 
Yeah. So this is a painful photograph of the uh, foot uh, from I can see from the back as well as from the front. From the back, I can see that on the left, on the right hand side, I can see there is a hind foot is in varus. Uh, looking from the front, I can see uh, that there is a cavus deformity which is present in the midfoot. I can also appreciate that there is a, a clawing of the uh, of the hallux as well as the lesser toes, uh, and there is the forefoot is in uh, is in adduction. Yeah, very good. And um, so clinically, if you were going to assess him, any any tests you might want to do? I would like to do at this stage a Coleman block test, try to assess whether there is, uh, is it is it forefoot driven or is it hind foot driven. So this will help me to assess whether this is flexible or or rigid side of uh, various. Okay. And um, what investigations might you want to do? Sorry, so with the Coleman block, obviously, just just as we said, he's got such a tight Achilles, it might it might not be positive, even though he might still be flexible. So we obviously we, we lie him down as well and we assess him as as you would do. Um, but what imaging would you like? So in terms of imaging, uh, we we'll like to have a weight bearing uh, views of the AP and the lateral of the foot with the ankle. Okay. okay, so so this is your AP of both feet. So what do you notice on this AP? Uh, so this is a radiograph of both the feet, uh, weight bearing views. Uh, on the uh, right hand side, I can see that there's an increased uh, uh, calcaneal pitch. Uh, looking at the uh, uh, Mary's angle, uh, the Mary's angle is increased. Uh, and so it's, 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 it's tricky because this, he's so rotated, he almost looks like a lateral that you can actually see the calcaneal pitch in the Miri's angle on this AP. Yeah, it? so yeah, that is yeah. really seen the AP in the lateral view. Yeah, I know, but he's yeah. so rotated that it, it, you, can, you can practically measure it, can't you? So, so yeah, so you see a, you're seeing a lot of rotation here, aren't you? A lot of rotations, yeah. Yeah, and, and he looks like he's got some adduction as well. Yeah. Um, and, and, and this is his lateral. Yeah. So in, in terms of the lateral, like, like you said, so what do you think of his calcaneal pitch? Uh, the calcaneal pitch looks normal in this because the angle is less than, uh, I mean, it, it looks like around 10, 10, 15 degrees. Yeah. And, and what do you think of his overall equinus deformity? Uh, because if we see the alignment of the talus, uh, I cannot appreciate any uh, depreciation, uh, I mean, declination of the talus. But if we look at the... Um, uh, uh, the metatarsals, the first metatarsal is, is severely plantar flex uh, mm -hmm. because all the alignment of the metatarsals, they are not maintained. And there's no overriding of the metatarsals. Yeah. So, so if you were to draw the lines like you would the core or say you, 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 you draw it something like that, would you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so like if you're coming to surgical correction for this chap, because that, that's where we're going with him. Yeah. Um, so there's some nuances here, aren't there? So, if he's flexible, most of his deformities you might be able to do with a soft tissue release. What do you think you might need to release? So in terms of soft tissue, uh, since the tender eclis is tight, so that would involve uh, lengthening of the tender eclis tendon. Uh, uh, then uh, in terms of soft tissues, it will be the, uh, using tendon transfers like tibialis posterior transfer to the medial or the, or the, or the lateral cuneiform and, and to a tendon transfer from peroneus longus to peroneus brevis to avert the foot. Okay, very good. And and how would you address the equinus? Uh, 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 we can address the equinus by doing uh, like we're doing a first dorsiflexion osteotomy of the um, first metatarsal dorsiflexion closing with osteotomy of the first metatarsal, and yeah, also yeah, doing can... a yeah, and uh, also doing a tendoeclis lengthening. Okay, but but as as you said, his calcaneal pitch isn't bad, so we don't want to lengthen his Achilles too much because the equinus isn't all coming from the ankle. Some of it's coming from sort of this region, isn't it? The navicular cuneiform joints. Okay. So if we say that his, um, his problems are throughout the whole, whole navicular cuneiform region, how might you address the equinus at this level? Do you know any ways you might do that? Yeah, the, uh, the slide that you showed that we can do a, like a wedge tar, tar set. Yeah. Like Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the nuances here is, as you've rightly said, the significant rotation, which you can assess by feeling, and the tendon transfer, so the tip post in this case, and um, that might correct the residual reduction. And the other nuances are that the tibio tailor joint, you can have an Achilles lengthening, as you said, but a lot of it's at the midfoot. So you can do a veg tarsectomy. So um, that's actually what we did. And actually we used a computer to plan it. Um, and actually this is probably the first one in the UK we did using a computer to plan it. Um, and the reason we did it is because he was 28 and wanted to spare his joints. So we did it all through the, um, 
cuneiform. So we got a nice 3D model. And what he had in the end is he had an Achilles lengthening, as you said, a calcaneal osteotomy, as you said, a veg tarsectomy through the cuneiforms, a tip post transfer, and then we sorted out his four foot things. And that's what he looked like afterwards. So he went from, um, you see his right foot now looks like his left foot or slightly better after we did it. Um, we had to bridge the joints a little bit. And when you look at it from the lateral side, this is a weight bearing CT scan from both sides. You'll see that his heel is now down to the ground with a normalized calcaneal pitch and his foot looks like it's corrected at the correct level. And this is him walking um, um, and his good foot, this is three months post-op and now that's his good foot and his other foot has a foot drop and he's pretty well balanced and pretty well aligned. So um, it can be quite successful. So uh, well done, Naeem, very well done. And we can move on to the next case for the next five minutes. Thank you. I think that's Vivek and Matt. Well, that's Vivek. Going to Right, so we've got Vivek. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, so we've got a 23-year-old, again, CMT. Um, this is a, um, a case that was done just a few weeks ago here. Uh, so foot drop, cave of Aris. Um, tried it again, tried all the spins, couldn't get on, terrible balance. So move to the next slide. So left-hand video, can you comment on his gait? So he's got a, um, a foot drop uh, gait on the... Well, both sides um, uh, is not really got stability in stance uh, or clearance and swing. He's not able to pre-position his foot for, for initial contact. Very good. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering whether he's got a weakness in his tibialis anterior. Yeah, absolutely. So he's yeah got a foot drop, high high steppage gait, and he's sort of lateral foot foot striking, poor balance. Yeah. Now the next video. Yeah. I'm asking him to bring the foot up. What do you notice when he's bringing the, trying to bring the foot up? Like you say, weak tip out. Anything else you notice? So he's recruiting his uh, extensor, long extensor um, uh, tendons in his, in his feet to and try to dose flex. What's that called? So a cock up toe deformity. Yeah, or, or, or extensor recruitment. So as you say, he's trying to use his ex long extensors to, to dose flex. And then if we play the video again, I'm asking him to, in after the bring him up, I ask him to invert and evert. So what do you notice when we do that, just after this bit? So he's got, uh, so he's got good eversion. Uh, it's good in, good inversion. So a, a strong, relatively strong tip post, but I'd say grade three eversion, which could be a, a weak peroneus brevis. Okay. So what what are the typical muscle imbalances that you get with CMT? Yeah. The classical. Yeah relative weakness of tibialis anterior and peroneus brevis to tib post and peroneus longus. Yeah, so tib post overpowers peroneus brevis and peroneus longus overpowers tib ants, exactly as you say, which gives you the characteristic deformities. So looking at these pictures here, um, what do you notice looking on, on the left? I mean, it's a, bit, it's a bit random as a question, but looking at the left-hand image, anything you can notice? Uh, he's, it looks like he's got four foot uh, adduction uh, and a subtle cavus deformity on the right hand side. Yeah. Well, what do you think those red marks are? Uh, it could be from uh, uh, ankle foot orthoses that he yeah. uses. Yeah. So he relies on AFOs and his foot is just deforming in them. Um, so you can see, and you can see from the middle picture, you know, is he, and also on the right hand picture. Um, anything you know, looking on the lateral border of the foot, anything you can notice there? That's it. Lateral callosities from loading, lateral loading. Yeah, so he's got a big lateral callosity at the base of the fifth metatarsal from loading on that point. Yeah, go on, move on. So as you say, foot drop, high steppage gait, various heel. It was flexible. I'm, I'll tell you that when you examined him, it was all flexible. Plants flex first metatarsals. As you say, zero out of five tib ant, five out of five tib post, two out of five perineus brevis. So these are his x-rays. There's not a great deal to notice from these, um, but looking at, yeah, okay. So this is just showing there's not much in the way of arthritis there. Yeah. So I hope you can see these pictures. So these are intraoperative pictures. So the top left picture, can you see my blue dots? Yeah. What, what, what are the, why have I put those? This, these are uh, my incisions being marked out. Why have I marked those blue dots? 
medial side over the navicular, so to post uh, tendon transfer harvesting. Good. Excellent. And the second picture, yeah, you can see those blue dots. Why have I marked those out? Any ideas? You can see I'm pulling the fourth toe down at the same time. Extensor tendon uh, lengthening. So now this, yeah, this, you, you, may, you may or may not know this. When you pull the fourth toe down, you'll see the superficial perineal nerve. Okay. So because you've got lots of incisions around, I like to see that. And then can you see there's a few dots behind that? What do you think they yeah. represent? Why have I put those there? That's the transfer to the lateral cuneiform. Perfect. Absolutely. That's the position of the lateral cuneiform, which is where my tip post is going to go to. Uh, top right image. That is for the calcaneal osteotomy. Yeah. What, what's that incision or approach called? The extended uh, uh, lateral uh, incision. Excellent. And is there any others you're aware of? You can do a yeah. calcaneal osteotomy through. You can use just a, a single uh, minimally invasive incision. Yes, yeah, so you minimally invasive or, or another There's one other. Uh, Ollie is well, no, an oblique so you could just do a, a straight oblique incision over the osteotomy yeah now bottom left picture you can see I've marked out three lines hokey uh, uh, Achilles tendon lengthening say that again hokey Achilles tendon yeah, lengthening perfect. yeah so they're for my percutaneous Achilles lengthening and the next ones are in, you know, at the end of the operation so you can see the second picture along on the bottom there's my tip post being harvested from there. And above that is where it gets pulled out. The, the front, the, the front uh, that it currently points to there is for the dorsiflexion osteotomy of the first. And exactly as you say, you can see where the tip post has been plugged into there. And then looking from the bottom at the end of the operation, the heel's now in neutral. So this is an example of a flexible deformity with a calcaneal osteotomy, dorsiflexion of the first, tip, tip post tendon transfer. You can see there's my calcaneal osteotomy. There's my pin just showing that I'm in the lateral cuneiform. And that's my dorsiflexion, which has brought the big toe up. So well done. You did very well. That was excellent. Thank you. Okay, great. So we're, we're on our last one, which we'll do in about four minutes or so. So um, have you got Alex? Uh, yeah, that's me. I'm sorry. Hiya. About that one. Hiya. So um, Alex, um, we've got a 55-year-old lady with CMT on the left side. Unfortunately, she's got a bit of a delayed presentation and presents with a severe fixed hind foot virus. Clearly, she's got both sides, but we'll talk about just the left. And she's also got a foot drop. Um, that's what it looks like from the front. So would you like to describe these deformities for me, please? No problem. So the heel is in varus, and I actually can see that the lateral uh, malleolus actually is very prominent as well. Um, I can see she's got a, ca a cavus deformity an adduction of the forefoot. Um, it's quite severe in the fact that she's actually, her toes are curled and her, foot, her first ray does look very plantar flex and the, her um, hallux does look um, curled as well and plantar flexed. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what, what type of deformity might this be? I know it's a very severe one, but what type of deformity from the four types of cavus might this be? So uh, it's... Cave of Aris, it, yeah, it's, like exactly. it's, it's like to be a fixed deformity as well if it's delayed yeah. presentation. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. And um, so what, what sort of investigations would you want to do for her? I would like to do weight bearing x-rays, AP and lateral of the foot and ankle. Okay, so, so what, what do you notice on these? So starting from the top, so starting from the ankle on the lateral view, she has a flat top talus with signs of osteoarthritis within the joint itself. It does look like she has some osteoarthritis of the subtalar joint, but it does also appear like she has a, um, like almost like the talus is over over the top of the calcaneum, so it's difficult to see say completely. Um, on the lateral view, also she has the uh, metatarsals aren't overlapping each other. It appears that the fifth metatarsal is um, she's weight bearing a lot through that, and the first ray is very plantar flexed. Uh, with yeah. curly toes at the end. Uh, on the AP, her ankle is in quite a degree of rotation um, with her ankle um, internally rotating. Yeah. Her, her calcaneum looking, um, the calcaneum through the talus, it appears to be in varus. Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. So 
when you're approved now this lady wants surgery well she no. doesn't want it but she kind of needs it um so now we've seen a few cases of these stiff things so what is your approach going to be i'm just going to i'm going to just going to ask you a few questions to sort of focus you a little bit because of time no problem. Um, how are you going to address this subtalar joint and how are you going to correct the hind foot varus in terms of uh, i want to know if it I know that she's got arthritis in her ankle from the x-rays, but I think it's important to do a clinical examination to see actually how flexible a subtalar joint is. Um, so a subtalar joint, you get you as far as you can work out, is completely rigid. Her whole deformity, okay. in fact, is completely rigid. It goes more into varus, but it doesn't go into valgus at all. Okay. Uh, so in order to correct a hind foot, I think uh, we're going to have to consider a fusion in this case. Okay. Um, and what would you like to fuse? I'd like to fuse her ankle because there's already, already osteoarthritis there. And actually by correcting her, fusing her ankle, will be able to correct the rotational deformity in her ankle at the yeah. same time. And also fuse her subtalar joint because it's already, uh, um, it's already stiff. Um, yeah. I'd like to be um, contributing, contributing a lot to her deformity. So by yeah. correcting the abnormality of her ankle, by fusing it and correcting the rotation and fusing a subtalar joint, I think we could get a, a hind foot in neutral. Okay, so what's, and what's that called? You're absolutely right. So, and what's that called? Uh, hind foot fusion. Yeah, or, or TTC fusion, tibio yeah. calcaneal. So going down the algorithm on a fixed deformity, you're going to do a hind foot fusion exactly as you said. She doesn't necessarily need a triple. We do need to address the four foot deformities. So she's still going to need a tibialis tendon transfer to try and correct some of that adduction. She's still going to need balancing of the forefoot with metatarsal dorsiflexion osteotomy. She's probably going to need something doing about the toes at some point. Yeah. Um, so that's what I ended up doing for her. Uh -huh. um, and this, this took a long time because it was quite tricky. She had very little bone and you had to get her heel all the way across here into valgus and, and fire it down. But if you do the right thing, that's her before and that's her after. Um, and that's her before, uh, before and after in the wrong order. So, well, well, very well done. So we've, um, we're not going to talk about case six, um, but we've basically gone through a series of fixed and flexible deformities. And I think all three of you did really, really well. So thank you. Yeah, thank you guys uh, for a fabulous session. I think it's about time to, to wrap it up. Unfortunately, we're rapidly running out of time, but uh, there are a couple of questions uh, that have come through, but I'm afraid, again, we're just going to have to leave those. So uh, firstly, thanks to Matt and Curran for a fabulous talk and a fabulous uh, case series. Well done to uh, the volunteers. I thought you were all absolutely incredible. And I'm sure you just walked the exam and good luck for that if you've got it next week. And just to say again, uh, thanks very much to our sponsors, Ramsey Healthcare. Uh, so we'll draw it to a close and uh, yeah, take care everyone. Thank you. My name is Andy Jones. I'm the CEO of Ramsey here in the UK. Ramsey Healthcare is a global provider of healthcare. Uh, we operate in 11 countries, employing 77,000 staff. And incredibly, we look after over 8 million patients a year. Ramsey Healthcare has been here in the UK for the last 12 years. We've now become the number one provider for NHS services, which means that GPs are able to choose Ramsey Hospitals to refer their patients for high quality healthcare. So Ramsey has got a long-standing set of values called the Ramsey Way. They really define who we are as an organisation, how we work together, how we look after patients, and ultimately it's all about people caring for people. We're very proud of the services that we provide and that's largely due to teamwork and our staff. The difference that this makes for patients is really high quality healthcare in all of our hospitals and facilities. We've got an absolutely fantastic programme called Speaking Up for Safety. It's all about training staff to be positive and to call out episodes in patients' care, particularly when they're concerned that things aren't going right. We've been able to grab this programme and we're the first organisation in the UK to roll this programme out. The future for Ramsey Healthcare is bright both globally and for us here in the UK. All of our units are accredited for endoscopy. The Care Quality Commission has rated 92% of our hospitals as good and 95% of our patients would recommend us to their friends and family. We're a leader in day case surgery. We've looked at the way that our hospitals are designed so that we can treat ever more patients in today's healthcare.
The future of healthcare is all about partnerships and integrating the patient journey. At Ramsey, this means we need to be working very closely with all our partners, including the NHS, to make sure that our services are available in all the communities that our hospitals serve. Over time, I can see the company both growing and expanding in the reach of its services. But for me, most of all, patient safety and quality come first. Simply put, people caring for people.